Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly philosophical talks with Stephen Friedman. Stephen Friedman is acclaimed by the New York Times as a great philosopher. Also, he's a scientist, artist, and a very good speaker. And today's topic of our philosophical talks is decision making and the philosophy of disinformation. Please feel free to ask your questions to give your feedbacks. And first of all, also, we would like to thank the US Consulate General here in Almaty. American Space Almaty, and our amazing speaker, Stephen Friedman. Thank you very much, Stephen. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aliyah. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome back to these talks. I know you were on vacation for a couple of weeks, so I welcome you back to the talks. Um, I also want to thank uh, Elmira, Dana, um, Anand, and the U.S. Consulate in Almaty for, again, giving me this platform, giving philosophy a platform. It's the major devotion that I have intellectually. I, I've, as, as Leah mentioned, I've been involved in a number of different types of pursuits, activities, um, science, molecular biology, um, art, um, architecture. Um, but for me, the common core of understanding relates fundamentally to philosophy. It's philosophy that can not only help clarify our beliefs, it can bring a critical eye to everything we do, intellectually, in our lives, in our decision making, and it can, it can provide both a firm foundation to our lives and also bring us to a, a limit of freedom that religions aspire to, aspire to in terms of faith or belief, but that philosophy is able to embrace and achieve rigorously. And, and I've, I've made the point often that one doesn't have to use the word philosophy at this point. One could simply use the term rigor. And that is something that you know, is even though philosophy is not well understood, well appreciated, rigor is something that's embraced throughout contemporary society, um, especially at the level of science, medicine, mathematics, uh, engineering, the um, activities that engage us at the highest levels of creative enterprise. Okay. Um, As an introduction, since we're talking about decision making, um, let me say a few things just broadly. Um, I've addressed these issues generally in, in previous talks. I've um, also addressed them in my play, Phalaris's Bull, um, which is actually seeable, viewable um, online. Uh, it was also made available during um, last year's Philosophy Day. Uh, <clears throat> when we're talking about decision-making, we'd like to always make a distinction between epistemic, rigorous, and heuristic approximate spaces. Um, epistemically, rigorously, philosophically, we can't ever validate you know, a decision. We can't make the appropriate comparisons that would allow us to say not only which is the better decision, but which is the better outcome. So, for example, I give the analysis in Phalaris's bowl of a decision to go to two different universities, let's say Harvard or Yale, in order to know we've made a valid decision. To evaluate our decision, we'd have to go to Harvard, rewind in time, go to Yale, compare. Even if we could do that, we wouldn't know when to stop the comparison after one year or five or 10, and there's no fundamental stopping point. And even if we could rewind in time to make a comparison, and even if we could know when to stop, we wouldn't know what we should be choosing among, Harvard or Yale or some other set of possibilities. You know, going off to an island somewhere, pursuing an entirely different course. So decision-making rigorously is fundamentally problematic. Um, I, I prescribe, you know, for such decision-making, 
flipping a coin since we can't rigorously evaluate the outcomes. And, you know, by flipping a coin, um, I always have coins available for the process. Um, I have here an American quarter. I have a British pound and I have a Kazakhstan piece. Um, it doesn't matter what coin you use. Okay. Um, and in fact, it doesn't even matter if the two sides are the same or different. That's the nature um, of our limitation in terms of making evaluations rigorously. And, and that's a freedom that frees us from the anxiety, frees us from the stress associated with decision-making as if we could legitimately know. It's, it's fundamental to the entire Western philosophical tradition, for example, the, the tradition that begins with Socrates' farewell to his friends after having been condemned to death by the Athenian court. You know, and so we go our separate ways, you to live and I to die, and which is better, only God knows. So flip a coin. And I've given also um, parables in, in, in Hinduism and in um, Zen Buddhism, you know, about, you know, Zen master, um, advice, you know, um, in a village where a young boy is given a horse. Um, I told this story before, but if you haven't participated in previous talks, it bears repeating. Um, um, he's given a horse for his 14th birthday. Um, everybody in the community applauds, how wonderful, how wonderful. The Zen master says, we'll see. Um, a few years go by, the boy falls off the horse at a riding incident, um, badly injures his leg. You know, he can only walk with a limp. Um, everybody says, how terrible, how terrible. The Zen master says, we'll see. Um, a few years later, war breaks out. Everyone in the village, all the young you know, men in the village go off to war. Um, the boy whose leg was badly injured, you know, can't go off to war. Everybody says, how wonderful, how wonderful. And the Zen master again says, we'll see. So that's the nature of all of our circumstances that we don't know the final outcome. And it's the final outcome that's decisive in the evaluation. It's same thing in sports, same thing in the Olympics. The outcome decides who gets the medal. And, and by the way, um, next week's talk, I think is going to be devoted to the Olympics and all kinds of philosophical aspects, considerations relating to the enterprise training, um, the, the, the role that Olympics plays in our lives. Okay. Other than rigorous considerations about decision making, we make decisions, what I call heuristically, in heuristic space. That's the space of approximations, where the space of, of objects that we see around us, chairs and tables, the space basically in which we are trying to achieve a specific goal. In heuristic space, we can't ever you know, philosophically justify a given goal, we don't know that a given goal is ultimately in our interest. But in heuristic space, in fact, the term heuristic relates to goal achievement, the means by which we achieve a particular end, a particular result. So in heuristic space, which is sort of the normal circumstances in which we live and think and speak and, and decide, we want to achieve a particular goal, we achieve that goal by means of convergence, by means of bringing different factors together. An Olympic athlete wants to succeed. That involves a lot of repetition, a lot of training. It involves lots of factors, diet and sleep and coaching and mental preparedness, lots of factors, an extraordinary number of factors go into the achievement of a goal such as an Olympic performance, an Olympic medal winning performance. Um, we see that you know, throughout the, the realm of sports, for example. Um, recently, um, Djokovic, the tennis player, won Wimbledon. 
Um, Djokovic is a tennis player that for whom everything matters. You know, every aspect of, of training and preparation is given careful consideration. And that becomes ultimately his competitive advantage. Well, when we're making decisions within juristic space about, oh, um, if we want to become, you know, an, an athlete, you know, excelling in a certain discipline, well, it's a matter of bringing convergences together, bringing elements together. If we are deciding among two different possibilities, Harvard and Yale, juristically, in juristic space, not epistemically, rigorously, philosophically, then we consider the greater set of convergences. Which school has the greater reputation? Which school has more illustrious alumni? Which school has greater financial resources, maybe? Which school has weather that's more favorable to us? We consider all the factors that cohere in, in one school versus the other and choose the one that has the greater set of factors and the greater weight of factors. Or maybe we're interested in pursuing, well, in my case, it was philosophy, and I felt Harvard had the better philosophy department at the time. That was a weighted, a highly weighted factor, a factor that helped influence ultimately the outcome. I, I went to a cousin whom I respected. He, he, um, he said to me, you got into Harvard? Go. To him, it was clear that Harvard was for me the better choice. And he had, I, I respected him enormously. So that opinion carried weight. And that was one of the factors, one of the convergences that helped me decide, okay? So just to kind of sketch out you know, um, a little bit of the basis, the framework, you know, for a discussion of decision making generally. And to make it a little more mathematically precise, again, not, <clears throat> not that all of this needs to be fully understood. I present things just in some cases so you hear them. And then when you rehear it or revisit it or, or re see it, you might understand you know, something a little bit, you know, better than you did previously. That's how it is for me. That's how it is for everyone. When we're encountering anything, any subject, any endeavor. So here again is the mathematical form of all of this. A heuristic space H is a convergent space. A equals A. Two things come together. Um, an epistemic space is a divergent space. Two things, any two things are not identical are distinguishable. And, and again, a simple sort of summary of that, any two things are heuristically approximately the same for some purpose or other, you know, like parts of a cell phone that can substitute one for another if one of the parts breaks versus rigorously distinct, distinguishable. Any two parts that we're contemplating putting into a cell phone can be distinguished. They occupy different positions in space. And from the standpoint of rigor, that ultimately matters decisively. Okay. Um, now, when I, one of the reasons why I'm addressing this topic, um, which as I'll develop it, is because of a lot of misinformation, disinformation that one hears about scientific issues, about vaccines, about COVID. Um, it's become a major concern, um, something that has received a lot of media attention um, in the United States, um, I'm guessing in other parts of the world as well. Uh, social media um, has become, you know, over the last about 15 years or so, an enormously powerful instrument of communication. Um, but it can also effectively spread rumors and superstitions and disinformation. Human beings have always been vulnerable to superstition, to, to belief that doesn't stand reasonable assessment, let alone rigorous assessment. 
And the conditions for evaluating information can be challenging. So I want to address some of these factors, some of these issues. First, what, when I first thought of the topic, what came to mind was a statement that J. Robert Oppenheimer, an American theoretical physicist um, of the mid 20th century, um, he was the man who led the scientific division of the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb. He's called the father of the atomic bomb. <clears throat> J. Robert Oppenheimer actually um, also went to Harvard um, and, and there were some similarities. You know, I don't really dwell so much upon biography. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I was mostly interested in, in the science more than the personalities behind the science, but I would always read a little bit, you know, about the individual, him or herself. In the case of, in, in, in some cases, similarities would draw me to the person. Um, here we have an image of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He was um, a brilliant man. Um, he was not just an accomplished physicist and a theoretical physicist, but he had broad sensibilities and background in the arts, in religion. Um, famously, when the atomic bomb was initially tested in New Mexico, his comment after the explosion was something from the Bhagavad Gita, um, the, the Hindu sacred work, the Song of God. And now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. So Oppenheimer had a poetic sensibility. Um, in fact, some people say that the reason he never ultimately won a Nobel Prize, which many of the other people working on the Manhattan Project did, people like Richard Feynman, Edward Teller, Hans Bethe, um, was because he had a sense of the limitations of science given his religious and even philosophical orientation and, and sensibilities. Well, um, Oppenheimer also um, at Harvard conducted himself much as I did. Um, I, I think I've mentioned that when I was there, I mostly went to the library and read. Um, if it was a matter of like reading or, or encountering philosophy, for me, it was more rewarding to read the great philosophers that were available to me in books, to read the works of Kierkegaard or of Hegel or of Nietzsche or of Aristotle, rather than focus upon the lectures, you know, of the philosophy professors on the, at the, fa on the faculty at, at Harvard, even though they were among the great philosophers in the world at the time, I didn't quite think they rose to the level of Kierkegaard or of Wittgenstein. So I mostly devoted myself to reading in the library. I educated myself by myself as much as Harv at Harvard as I had done previously in growing up. Oppenheimer did the same. Um, Thoreau, the, the 19th century transcendentalist American philosopher, did the same. Um, Thomas Wolfe, um, a major early 20th century American writer, did the same. Basically, um, Harvard actually had, at the time, the world's largest university library. Um, before the internet you know, was, was developed, having lots of books on hand physically in a library was a key to a, an expansive education. So it was a rare opportunity to have access to those books and I took advantage and so did Oppenheimer. Another connection is apparently he started reading physics when he was 11 um, and I started around the same age. Actually, I, I, I mentioned in Valeris' book um, about uh, going to the library and, and coming home with a, like a college um, physics textbook when I was 10 um, and starting to read it and, and having no clue at all what I was reading. 
um, that that the first paragraph took me a night to read, and I still didn't understand, but I kept reading. And, and that provided me with a lesson in how to like enter a subject that I hadn't experienced, enter a subject that I was not even prepared to access just by being persistent. And persistence is going to matter, you know, in terms of keeping ourselves, our, our, our culture, like sufficiently educated um, to make intelligent, reasonable decisions about complex issues. Well, Oppenheimer famously wrote, with all that as background, famously wrote that no one should leave our university system without the recognition that he or she will be an ignorant person. And not through any fault of their own, but in the nature of things. There's simply too much to have to command. There's too much that is now known. And, and much of it is at levels that require lots of preparation, lots of background to be able justly to understand and come to terms with and evaluate. Okay? Well, this notion of you know, living in a world where there is vastly more to know than is possible for a single person, a single mind, no matter how great, is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, it goes back a few hundred years that we've been in that situation. Up until the 17th century, it was said that Leibniz, the philosopher, mathematician, co-inventor of the calculus, uh, a diplomat, a historian, a polymath, somebody who was gifted and accomplished in many different directions, a German philosopher and mathematician. He's mostly, I think, celebrated now for his philosophical work and for his mathematical work. It's said that Leibniz was the last human being capable of having known and understood everything known at the time he was living. But again, that is, and, and Leibniz, by the way, was a contemporary of Newton's, but Newton was much more focused, um, just as powerful a mind, um, but more focused. Um, Leibniz had a much greater range of interests and, and pursuits. So he was in a position, you know, to survey the whole in the way that people since have not been able to. The, well, one, one thing that's interesting though, is that type of comprehensive knowledge and understanding doesn't necessarily lead to the best creative results. Leibniz liked to reason his way through to conclusions in, in kind of a, a linear fashion. Like um, Einstein once said that logic takes us from A to B. That's what Leibniz would do. He would reason from A to B and then B to C in sort of a, 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 a careful logical progression. Newton and Einstein were examples of people that relied more upon intuition, physical intuition, sense of what the final form of the solution is likely to be. Because it's very easy to make mistakes as you're sort of reasoning step by step. Einstein, in fact, said, you know, logic can take you from A to B, imagination can take you anywhere. The ability, imagination relates to imaging, visualizing, having a sense of what the final solution will look like. E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous equation, wasn't arrived at by a careful logical progression. It was, there was some of that, but there was also a fundamental intuition as to the form of the solution and what a reasonable solution might look like. It turns out that Einstein and Newton relying more upon physical intuition than step-by-step -step reasoning were rarely wrong. 
Leibniz, relying more upon like very close reasoning step by step, was wrong about half the time. So there, that's um, so knowing everything does not necessarily conduce to you know, generating the most powerful and the most validatable results. But still, um, there was Leibniz, but that was, you know, over 300 years ago now. And knowledge has just expanded exponentially. Right? I mean, what, when I was in molecular biology, you know, I had some grounding in some, you know, areas of the discipline, but it's like every day what's added to the field is the, the, the totality of my knowledge of molecular biology, you know, when I was actively engaged in it. So, you know, that, now we're talking about regions where artificial intelligence, you know, will probably be, you know, helpful because a computer can be programmed, can be inputted with everything that's known. So it has that advantage. The human mind doesn't have that capability. Okay. Um, the notion of knowing a lot is central to philosophical endeavor. The pre-Socratic Greek philosopher Protagoras, um, who's famous for having said, man, a human being, is the measure of all things. Also, famously remarked, though a little bit less famously, this is not as well known, to do philosophy, one must know everything. Well, again, when Protagoras was writing, two and a half millennia ago, there was that possibility, certainly. But not any longer, right? But, but still, you have to try. And, and this is something I address also in Phalaris' Bull. Phalaris' Bull is half autobiographical, half philosophical. Um, I specifically address Protagoras' claim and, and go on, and I'll, I'll quote a little bit. Um, you have to try. And to master stuff, you have to teach. And to teach lots of subjects, you have to tutor, which I did. Hundreds of subjects from middle school through graduate and professional schools at universities around the world in law, medicine, dentistry, endodontics, aeronautics, business, all the sciences. It was daily mental exercise with benefits. So social contact, daily structure, helping people succeed, money. Eventually, I was ready to write philosophy. Now, still having taught hundreds of subjects in lots of different fields does not mean <laughs> I know everything, obviously, right? But it's put me in a position where I have a sense of the structure, you know, of, of most things or enough things so that if there's something that I need to address that I've never encountered before, it doesn't take too long to orient to it. Because when we're dealing with knowledge, as I'm describing it, we're dealing with things that, you know, scientific knowledge, scientific understanding, um, the uh, understanding of different fields. We're dealing with things playing themselves out in heuristic space. We're dealing with convergent structures. Understanding is a convergent process where we expose ourselves to different aspects of something, draw connections, right? The, an explanation is a convergence. It takes a set of data, experiences, results, and, and converges it with, combines it with some intellectual structure 
that is the explanation, but there is a convergence taking place. So having exposure to lots of different fields allows one to have a foothold in, in virtually everything, not a complete mastery. I mean, as I said, I've, you know, I was trained in, to, you know, formally in, in graduate school in molecular biology, but I can't claim to, you know, have familiarity with more than a small fraction, you know, of that field. But nevertheless, I understand enough about its processes. Like I remember the first time I had to read a, a paper in molecular biology. Actually, I had to give a talk on a paper in molecular biology. It was the first month or so that I was in this program. And actually, it was before I was in this program, I was interning in a laboratory. And my mentor, um, came to me and, and actually gave me some guidance. And I started, because I was starting to read through the paper and, and I didn't understand every other word. You know, there were, there were references to, to chemicals, to molecules. I didn't know their structure. I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and, and, and he showed me that, well, you know, some of this is in English and some of this is important vocabulary, you know, that you'll know, or if you don't know, you'll look up. But other things like details of an experimental procedure, well, you don't need to know it in detail. You just need to know the kind of thing, the kind of, of, of procedure that they're, they're carrying out. If you need to reproduce it in the lab for your own purposes, then you can look up the details. So, and, and the same thing, I had a, um, a cousin who was a, a physician, actually a well-known physician in this country. Um, he was a professor at UCLA, he was an author, um, he was an endocrinologist, he was very bright. Um, and he was my personal physician when I was growing up, and he was my doctor. Um, and I remember, so after, you know, I would see him, you know, for a checkup, um, he'd take me into his office and we'd have a little discussion because he was family. Um, and I remember one time he showed me a journal that he received, like the Journal of the American Medical Association, maybe, you know, that type of journal, I don't remember specifically what it was. And, and he was going through the table of contents and he said, you know, a lot of these things are in so much detail, I'm not going to bother. You know, I'm going to pick and choose. And even where I pick and choose, I'm going to read a little bit. I might read an introduction, a discussion, something. And, and he said, that is effective. So there are approaches to not achieving the kind of complete assimilation of information of perhaps a Protagoras, maybe of a Leibniz, but to make it possible for us to maneuver right, in, in a world of increasing technological and scientific complexity. Now, in terms of, though, this general sense of the degree of one's understanding mattering, well, it matters, it turns out, in, in ways that are decisive. There's a story um, I've told, I'm gonna to retell it. Um, it's actually a story that appears on this advertisement I have for my, my tutoring services. You know, I, I just mentioned that I tutor, teach one-on-one -on -one lots of different subjects. And so I have an ad for that. And, and I tell a story in that ad about a 20th century science reporter, um, a prominent science reporter. I don't remember his name. Um, and I don't know the publication he worked for, but it may have been the New York Times. It was a very, it was one of the world's most prominent science reporters, science writers, writing about contemporary science, working for you know, one of the most prominent newspapers. He was a major journalist. And, and he said that, and he interviewed every major scientist of the mid 20th century, every Nobel laureate, um, in, in a whole range of fields. Now, 
He apparently, when he was growing up, was interested in kites. And he was always fascinated by their aerodynamics, basically how they flew. Um, and he said that um, he always asked whoever he was interviewing, whatever their area of expertise, whatever other questions he might be interested in, in pursuing with them, to explain how a kite flies. Partly because he had some background in that himself, but also because he wanted you know, more clear explanations. He was dealing with the greatest minds, the greatest scientists, and, and he felt any one of them might be able to provide additional illumination, insight, understanding. So he always, it was also for him a way to, he, he said, evaluate their genuine stature, you know, as, as an intelligence that, you know, he knew that, you know, for any one of these fields of these individuals, they were, those fields were very quickly out of reach of what his background was. But he knew a little bit about kites and he could evaluate their intellectual capabilities and their overall understanding by their response to that question. And what he said was, of all the scientists, of all the Nobel Prize winners that he interviewed, only one ever gave him a clear and compelling and insightful explanation how a kite flies. And that was Einstein. Hmm? So it, it goes to the point that to understand anything well, you need to understand effectively everything. Well, that's true philosophically, as I said, in relation to like Protagoras's claim. Um, it's, it's true about any given field, that the, the, the greatest insight and understanding provided for the non-expert of that field is offered by the greater mind, the greater intelligence, the greater scientist we're talking about science. I found that to be true in all fields at Harvard, you know, where I was being exposed to individuals of great accomplishment. You know, all of these you know, professors, you know, were, um, you know, were, were intellectually, you know, capable, distinguished, but the best explanations of anything were always offered by the exceptional members of the faculty. I remember when I was taking um, first year calculus, um, the first semester was taught by, I think a graduate student really, and I basically learned it on my own. I didn't really gain much from the actual class itself. But the second semester, I was taught by a world famous mathematician. And that semester provided insights into the nature of the subject that are still central to my understanding of it. Now that's, that was true of my experience repeatedly, that the world famous biologist or the world famous oh, English professor was the individual that provided the most compelling insights because they brought so much to bear. Just as Einstein brought so much to bear more than any other human being in explaining something as simple as the flight of a kite. Okay. Which, so philosophy, wants that type of, well, the term is synoptic understanding, broad understanding, broad and deep. The broader, the deeper, the better. A person that wanted to be a philosopher, but chose a different direction because of specific limitations that he had was Freud. Freud, was not good at mathematics, 
and felt he couldn't then do philosophy. That is actually a reasonable position. You know, we, we think of philosophy or philosophers as engaged in a verbal activity, but many great philosophers have also been great mathematicians. Descartes is one of the greatest of all philosophers and is considered maybe not the first rank of mathematicians, that's Archimedes, Newton, Gauss, but the second rank, Pascal, Leibniz was as great a mathematician as he was a philosopher. So there's often an equality of capability. People that do philosophy well historically have had strong mathematical ability, quantitative ability, and strong verbal ability. It's, it's demanding in that way. Freud felt he didn't have the mathematical gift capability, and, and that is a requirement you know, for being able to do philosophy at the highest level. Because again, what is philosophy? It's rigor. And what field is most associated with rigor? Mathematics. So again, uh, it's a matter of the comprehensiveness, you know, of, of one's pursuits that make an activity like philosophy possible. Now, I want to get into this issue of broad accessibility for purposes of decision-making when it comes to technical matters, technical subjects. The arena for decision-making that's broadest is society, right? political systems. The American political system, democracy, right? involves the participation of large numbers of individuals right? in decision-making. Um, now, this is not a direct democracy. Um, only small populations are capable of exercising direct democracy where each individual votes on every matter being considered. Um, we're a representative democracy. You know, I'll make some comments about that too, a little bit more, um, a little bit to come. But the notion of large numbers of individuals, a large citizenry. Um, now, obviously, when the United States began, the citizens that were capable of voting were of more limited characteristics than today. Um, the, the franchise, as it's called, the um, number and, and types of people eligible to vote has expanded consistently over time, over decades. Um, originally, women couldn't vote. Um, slaves, you know, were not considered human beings. They were considered three-fifths of a human being. They were property. They couldn't vote. You know, as, you know, as the country has evolved, you know, slavery was, was extinguished and, and African Americans were given the vote. Women acquired the vote. Um, so, the number of individuals capable of participating in the broad decision making of the society in elections, you know, has expanded. But from the beginning, Jefferson, in particular, one of the founding fathers, emphasized the need for democracy to support an educated citizenry. People, if they're voting on you know, major, on, if they're voting on, on a president, if they're voting on individuals that are going to make the major decisions about their lives, you know, in terms of the direction of the society, they need to be informed. So Jefferson, for example, was an advocate of a free and open press because a free and open press is capable of informing. It's capable of discerning truth reasonably and disseminating it, spreading it. 
so that people can be aware of the major issues and the circumstances and factors feeding into those issues that allow for an informed, intelligent decision. Education, like the 19th century, saw an expansion of just public education so that you know, starting from the age of about five until the age of, well, now it's 18, um, until one graduates, like basic um, grammar and middle school and high school, like in the United States, one's being educated. One's, you know, the, the degree of public education was, was almost non-existent you know, in previous centuries. You know, most individuals, you know, who were not part of a specific elite um, in intelligentsia, you know, would, would acquire skills by apprenticeship. They would follow in the footsteps of, of their parents. They would acquire whatever skills their, their father or their mother exercised. They would not be broadly or deeply educated. But democracy demands that type of education for, again, informed, intelligent decision-making. Now, because it does demand that, democracy has not always been the embraced form of political organization of society. Most famously, Aristotle and Plato did not endorse democracy. You know, they saw democracy as one thing inefficient and for another thing, you know, likely to achieve ill-advised outcomes, not the most intelligent or judicious outcomes. They were aware, for example, as Shakespeare was aware that populations are vulnerable to demagogues, to people that can lead them in a certain direction, not for their interests, but for the interests of the demagogue. Hitler was popularly elected. So the founding fathers, but especially like Aristotle and Plato were aware of the problem of putting fundamental decision-making in the hands of a broad populace. They, in fact, endorsed more of a well, monarchical, dictatorial type of government. In fact, Plato, most famously in his Republic, developed the concept that a just society should be led by a philosopher king. The philosopher, because that was the individual capable of understanding the whole, in the case of, of Plato's specific philosophy, it was a matter of understanding like, the true nature of existence and the, the nature of the fundamental forms and categories of existence so that society could be appropriately ordered, so that each individual would have his best role within that society to achieve overall the most efficient and effective social organization. That effective and efficient social organization where each person was doing the task for which he or she was most fit constituted for, for um, Plato a just society. But that was a society under the guidance, under the controlling vision of the philosopher, again, called the philosopher king. And that's a famous category from, from Plato. Aristotle had a similar sense of democracy not being the most embraceable form of society, social organization and, and decision-making, human beings being what they are, okay? Um, and we see that throughout the history of philosophy, Thomas Hobbes, um, the English philosopher, um, also felt that human beings needed to be led, needed to be controlled. 
that they did not have broadly the ability to make fundamental decisions for themselves. It was John Locke who had faith in the basic goodness of human beings and the educatability of human beings to be able to rise to the demands of a democratic organization of society where the broad number of people in the population were making the fundamental decisions through some decision-making process, electoral process. The United States takes an intermediate position. Representative democracy is an intermediate position where one is electing individuals that presumably, hopefully, have the vision, the experience, the, the, the temperament, the understanding to make just judicious the best possible decisions for that society, for the direction that it's going to take, for the nature of its organization. So in the United States, um, we are voting for representatives that will then make their own determinations based upon their judgment. Now there's, there's this uh, tr traditionally a tension between you know, the idea that a representative that you're voting for should either carry out the will of the people expressly who voted for him or her, or use the fact that he or she has been elected as a, as a mandate to exercise his or her own best judgment. In the end, there's a combination of the two at play, but there is that fundamental sense that a representative is somebody who might have particular judgment or insight you know, for making the best possible decisions. But even that being the case, the individuals voting for that person have to be informed, right? They have to be able to make reasonable decisions, able, they must be able to sort of evaluate the information, the circumstances that bear upon any particular decision. For example, if somebody's going to endorse a certain policy and they're running for office, you want to be able to decide whether the policy or the direction um, that they're going to take relative to that policy is one that seems well informed, seems the best approach. Right? So there's a risk. The point is there is a responsibility on the part of the public to be able to become sufficiently informed in, in whatever ways are reasonable given the nature of our culture and the types of information that we need to assimilate. The Okay, so let me see. I have some questions that I'm going to address from last time, and I think I'm going to spend more time than typical on those. I just want to make sure I'm leaving myself enough time. Okay. Um, the challenge today, clearly, is the nature of technology, the nature of biotechnology, of medicine, um, means that we are being asked to make decisions about very difficult, elusive subject matter. And, and I want to give you some, some sense of that. Let me show you something. In terms of our capabilities, just our natural human capabilities, when we're dealing with the sciences, um, we're going to be addressing issues relating to numbers, numbers of things. I'll, illustrate that in a second. But I want to show you something about our 
relationship to numbers. If I show you this, you can see that's one, right? That's, a, that's one mark. You can see that without having to count it. You can automatically see that as one, one thing, one mark. If I show you this, you can see that that's four. You can see it's four without having to count it. Okay. If I show you this, you have to count. You can't just glance at that and know automatically that that's six in the way that you can glance at this and see that it's four. We have fundamental limitations. Our minds do, all of our minds do, in relation to number, assessing numbers of things. In the case of like the biological sciences, for example, something that bears on our decision making because it bears on whether we're going to take a vaccine or not, whether we trust the vaccines, you know, how we're going to, so the decisions we're going to make regarding, you know, basic like medical options that might be presented to us. The numbers involved in biological systems are completely beyond our ability to grasp intuitively. For example, there is an enzyme called catalase. It's a protein, it's a molecule. Um, it's present in virtually all cells, all of our cells. Um, the purpose of the enzyme, the protein, the molecule, is to break down hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a little chemical that is a poison to cells. It's a poison to us. We use hydrogen peroxide to kill like bacteria, to disinfect it, okay? It's a disinfectant because it kills, okay? It can damage our cells too. Hydrogen peroxide building up in cells is a problem for cells, okay? Well, there's an enzyme, a molecule, catalase, that breaks down hydrogen peroxide, so it's no longer dangerous. It breaks it down inside the cell to water and oxygen, okay? So the, the, the enzyme, the protein, the molecule, catalase, it's called, breaks down hydrogen peroxide, which is a poison for us, into two substances that are not poisonous. There are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of copies of hydrogen peroxide, of, of catalase in a given cell. But one molecule of catalase, one molecule of catalase is capable of breaking down 40 million molecules of hydrogen peroxide per second. That's the kind of numbers that are involved in biological systems. These are the kind of numbers that even people in the field can't intuitively like visualize. Just again, to give you a sense of, of how technical and how remote these fields are from normal human understanding and experience. Now, this, this plays itself out um, on a daily basis. I'll, give you a specific example. Doctors are highly educated in science and medicine, right? In general, a doctor will have taken basic science courses um, as in college, as an undergraduate, we call it. Then they'll go to medical school for four years. Then they will do a residency typically for another four or five years. They might have 15 years of training in science and medicine before they begin to practice. And then their practice is an ongoing education. Well, I hear doctors talking on like news programs, stations, programs like CNN, um, where they have medical experts. The medical experts that are doctors are often making comments about things like antibodies. 
that's related to our immune system that I can tell they don't fully understand like the biology, the biochemistry, the molecular biology of the antibody. These are doctors. Just a few days ago, um, I get articles or reports of articles on a daily basis from different branches of medicine. Um, a few days ago, I got a notice that an article on, on masks, mask wearing, and levels of CO2 um, building up in the mask was debunked, was, turned, was re retracted. The article was removed from publication. Um, it turned out that the, the data was not properly evaluated and that they were claiming that, that there were like high levels of CO2 building up inside the mask that could be a problem for children. Um, but it turns out that, uh, as other researchers were commenting, the CO2 and O2 pass readily. Air passes readily through a mask. So dangerous levels do not build up. There, was, there were comments on this article, and some of the comments were by doctors, by MDs. And the comments some of them were of the sort, well, if air can pass through a mask, then the virus can pass through the mask. So the mask inherently is not doing what we're hoping it's going to do. If air can flow in and out so freely that CO2 doesn't build up inside to a level that's dangerous, like for a child, then a virus can pass through freely, like the COVID virus. and and why are we wearing masks? Okay. Turns out the virus that causes COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2, that virus, is a thousand times the size of an oxygen molecule or a nitrogen molecule or a CO2 molecule, a thousand times larger. The virus though, in general, is not traveling just by itself. It's traveling usually attached to, to water droplets, very small water droplets, aerosols, but still water droplets, tiny. Those water droplets, and these are the ones that are suspended in the air, not heavy water droplets that drop to the air like within six feet. These are ones that are suspended. The virus is almost never alone. It's always attached to water. A virus particle like the SARS-CoV-2 virus attached to water gives a particle 10,000 times larger than CO2 or O2. This is why oxygen and carbon dioxide can pass through a mass readily and the virus is stopped. But there are comments from MDs not understanding that. Okay. So the point is, and here's another example of issues of what we can know and what's really more than can be expected of us, right? If doctors don't have a good command of antibodies, or if doctors can make, it can be wrong about this idea of what's called orders of magnitude, how relatively large or small things are, what's the general public supposed to do? Um, there was a, 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 a news commentator, an opinion um, commentator the other day who said, well, we need to inform ourselves. People need to do the research. <laughs> you could spend 20 years doing research to get clarity on one minor issue. It's too much to expect, too much to ask. There's a, um, a friend of mine who has multiple sclerosis. Um, her doctor gave her recently um, three options for treatment protocols, three new drug treatment protocols. There's a lot of active research in multiple scler sclerosis. And so they're always coming up with new medications. Um, so she was given three, she contacted me and she wanted my assessment. And I said, look, I don't have clinical experience with these. I don't know, I don't have patients that have been on these different protocols where I can make a reasonable decision. You can't make the decision. Your doctor has to make the decision. 
If your doctor can't make the decision, you have to go to a doctor who can because you cannot be expected to inform yourself of what's relevant to understand all the issues involved. See? So what's the upshot in terms of decision-making? We have to rely, it's again, a decision is the result of a convergence. We look at the factors going in. We look at the number of factors, we look at the weight of factors. The greater the number of individuals supporting a decision, the greater the authority behind those decisions, the more we can reasonably endorse that direction of choice. If it's a, if it's a matter of, like in this country, Harvard is an esteemed institution. It has high standards for its faculty. MIT, Caltech, Stanford, University of Chicago, the National Institutes of Health. These are institutions where there are high-minded individuals with substantial training, you know, high orders of intelligence, capable of assimilating large amounts of information with the background to judge with the background to make reasonable recommendations. We have to embrace those types of authorities, not blindly, but we have to embrace them. We cannot educate ourselves at the level of understanding required even to evaluate a vaccine. There's too much molecular biology. There's too much biotechnology that's new, that's not understandable, even to physicians. So we have to be able to trust in the authority. We have to be able to embrace reasonable authority that takes us away from the type of gossip or superstition or misinformation that's so pervasive on social media. We have to be intelligent in discerning where the information is coming from and the, the order of authority of that the individual, assuming that individual, and we have to be able to evaluate whether that individual is selfless or not, whether his interest is, is the science and, and the public well-being or personal profit. But the point is we cannot we are, we are each not living in the time of Leibniz. Even if we were, we are not Leibniz. We don't have the capability to properly assess all these technical fields and make reasonable decisions. We have to go to reasonable authorities and embrace what they're saying. There is no alternative. Okay. Now, okay, we have plenty of time for our questions. Excellent. Um, okay, let me, um, yes, let me, I have the questions here. Let me just look at them. Um, okay, so first question relates to Danny Boy, which was a song that I talked about last time. Remember, I talked about it in relation to a high school experience I had with it, where the high school English teacher played Danny Boy and asked the class for our sense of what the song meant, what was the story behind the song. And, and I, I told you there were lots of different interpretations um, that people had. Um, I didn't offer an interpretation. Instead, I offered a kind of meta analysis of the process, right? I was already doing a lot of philosophy by that time. And I suggested that the song provides data points, words, phrases that can be connected in all kinds of different ways, embellished in all kinds of different ways. And, and I suggested even that one of those interpretations that had been provided was a religious one, that Danny Boy could be seen as a parable of Christ, his, his, um, his death and his resurrection. That was one interpretation offered by somebody in the class. That's 
consistent with the data points that the song provides, okay? But this first question here, was it from the Bible, the Danny Boy rhyme, and how could it be published? Okay, so Danny Boy is not from the Bible. Um, the song, the music on which Danny Boy is based is an, a traditional Irish song. Um, Irish melody called Londonderry Air. The words to Danny Boy were written, and I think the year 1913, it was written by, and I'm gonna show you, it was, here's actually, here's actually the, the music, the cover for the actual music that was published, words and music. Um, Fred E. Weatherly was the person, the poet, who wrote the lyrics, wrote the words that then he wedded to the music, Londonderry Air, that much more ancient music. The, um, so, and again, from around 1913. So, no, the song does not come from the Bible. It does not have necessarily a specific relationship to anything in the Bible or the Christian tradition. That was one interpretation that was offered by somebody in my high school class. And it's an interpretation that one might find might be consistent with the basic words and images if one wanted to go in that direction. Okay, but um, again, so this song was the words to Danny Boy, the, the actual poem you know, of the song was written a little over 100 years ago. And, you know, the New Testament, 2000 years ago. So no direct connection. And, and it's not clear exactly what Weatherly, the author, was thinking. It doesn't matter, actually, by the way, what the person who writes a poem or a song was thinking in terms of the meaning of that song. I've written things that some time later or, or even some years later will strike me in, in a different way than they did when I first wrote them. And I'll realize that I was saying something other than I thought, that there were other things going on in my mind. Now, typically when, when I write a poem, and I think this is true for a lot of poets, songwriters, lots of things are going into that song or that poem from many different directions. It's a highly convergent process. You know, one day maybe I'll go through like one of my poems and I can tell you like some of the things that come together in that poem. A given poem for me does not have a single meaning or a single storyline. It's an amalgam. It's an aggregate of a lot of different sets of ideas and experiences. Okay? So I'm guessing Danny Boy is something similar. Okay. Now, next question. Oops. Here. Okay. Okay, now the next question I'm going to have an apology for. Um, what do you think about Danny Boy from Predator 2 being killed and could not save himself by using a weapon? Okay, I have to confess, I haven't seen the movie. Now, I was once asked a question about a movie and I was able to look it up and get enough information about the film to answer the question. In this case, I wasn't able to do that. I looked it up and I didn't get enough sense. Um, but let me just say this. Um, I saw Predator 1, the original. And the reason I saw that was because of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, and Arnold Schwarzenegger actually sort of connects to um, this talk a little bit in the sense that he's somebody I always found of considerable intelligence and, and insight. He became governor of California um, about 10 years ago. Um, he's somebody that displays, well, 
so a set of characteristics that are similar to what one sees in Olympic athletes that I'll be discussing next week, eh? um, a, a, a commitment to a goal. In his case at Bridget, it was bodybuilding, um, um, a whole range of capabilities um, that including not just intelligence, a sense of humor, um, uh, a sense of decency, a sense of morality, some of his like, comments um, public comments in, in, in recent years demonstrate some of what I'm saying, um, that contribute ultimately to his success and his, his status, you know, within the society, within the culture. If Arnold Schwarzenegger had been in Predator 2, I probably would have seen it, is I think the point. But unfortunately, so I can't address that specifically. Um, again, of course, I don't know that the song has any relationship to that movie, Predator 2. I, I have not seen it. Okay, so I apologize for that, but um, I'm going to try to make it up with the next answers. Um, okay. Um, can a person be lucky if he had time to pray to God? Okay. Okay. Um, My sense of this question is um, this, this deals with a very important issue. Um, it's something that I talk a little bit about in, in Phalaris's Bull, the idea that one of the reasons I'm writing aphoristically in a concentrated fashion is so that one can go to an aphorism for consolation, um, for the ability to address extreme circumstances when there's no time to read a novel or an essay. One needs an immediate concentrated response. So for example, at the moment of death, when I was experiencing the earthquake in Los Angeles in 1994, and I thought I was at that point because basically I was in an area of Los Angeles where the ground shaking was second in violence only to Northridge itself, which had produced a collapsed building and, and the death of a lot of the individuals in that building. Um, the building that I was in was at the verge of collapse. Inspectors later told me that that seemed to me to be the case, and I was waiting for that. And I was running aphorisms. I, I mentioned that there was an aphorism, "Selfless is how one acts, not out of need," that I ran through my mind whenever I was in a stressful situation. It didn't work, so I ran at the time what was a more fundamental aphorism: "The meaning of the world is its most general representation." one that wouldn't seem to relate to that situation, but it related to the nature of, of experience. And that worked, that calmed me in literally the face of death, because that was what I was convinced was about to happen and would have happened if a supporting wall had moved another quarter inch, another two millimeters that close anyway um so but one sees this in various traditions in hinduism for example the tradition is that whatever thought is is running through your mind at the moment of death helps determine the nature of your rebirth so hindus typically will as they lay dying recite verses from the Bhagavad Gita because that brings them close to God and that helps govern their rebirth. There's a, there's a, famous, there's a famous play, um, contemporary with, um, with Shakespeare. Um, it's, it's called Dr. Faustus. It was written by Christopher Marlowe. Um, Christopher Marlowe um, wrote blank verse, the kind of, of poetry that Shakespeare wrote in his plays that in some instances are at the level of Shakespeare. 
Um, he's, in my estimation, the only writer in English who has risen to that level, but not as consistently as Shakespeare. Um, but he did at the end of Dr. Faustus. Um, Dr. Faustus is about um, a man who makes a deal with the devil for unlimited knowledge and power, um, but in exchange for that, must give the devil Mephistopheles his soul you know, at the end of some period of time. And that time is about to expire at the end of the play, and Faustus realizes that he's about to be dragged to hell. And, and what he says is, Ah, oh, Faustus, now hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven, that time may cease and midnight never come. Now, he goes on, I'm not going to recite the whole thing, it's kind of long. He goes on to say, a drop of Christ's blood would save me, but the half a drop of Christ's blood would save me from eternal damnation. The problem is that at that moment, at that extremity, where he's facing eternal damnation as the clock is ticking down, he can't focus his mind. He can't, like bring his attention where he needs it, he's in too desperate a, sense of, a set of circumstances. So I tell people, in terms of the philosophy, the philosophy is strong enough, in my experience, and again, I'm only here because it, it's been validated through my experience. That's the only validation that I can attest to, right? that anyone can attest to. But in my experience, the philosophy works, my philosophical work um, functions at the moment of death and provides consolation. I had that experience. But I tell people, don't wait until that moment. I've been assimilating the philosophy for years. So now it is available to me. Remember, it's not a prison, right? It's, it's, it's a freedom. It's a switch that one can use under desperate circumstances. At this point, fortunately, I've assimilated the philosophy well enough that I haven't had to use it. Okay? But who knows, right? But again, I tell people, don't wait too long. In the case of Dr. Faustus, he waited too long. Okay? So that's a caution. Okay? Now, um, a major, okay, one more question from last time. Um, what is your best exhibition in the Hermitage? Okay, as I said, I have not been to the Hermitage. I would love to go to the Hermitage, okay? It's obviously one of the world's great museums, you know, at the level of the Louvre and, and the Prado and the National Gallery in London, one of the world's greatest museums with one of the world's greatest art collections, period. Okay. There's no debate, okay? But what I did do was online, went through, and I selected paintings that I find special. Um, the artists are people that I have a close relationship to as an artist, and, and these are things that I would seek out if I were there, and these are the artists that I most value that I would want to experience at the Hermitage, okay? So, um, I don't know, do we, should I show? I, I don't know if, okay, let me, I have these on my phone. Um, I think Aaliyah also has them, but maybe, should I show them? Maybe I should show them. Okay, so let me go through. I, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a number, but, um, okay, first of all, and if you can see this, Degas, and that Degas is, um, Degas is a late 19th century um, impressionist, kind of, but maybe the greatest draftsman you know, among the impressionists. Um, his work there um, is actually influenced by photography. 
um, the images, the, the, the figures are kind of cut off and are not centered as they would traditionally be. Um, again, the influence of photography was at play. Degas, one of the artists I most admire. Um, not the nicest of human beings, um, but you know, a great artist. Okay, this next work is Kandinsky. Um, Kandinsky is Russian, um, though he um, spent a lot of his creative life in Germany and then in France. He was a member of the German Bauhaus. Um, he's considered to be possibly the first abstract artist or the first person doing genuinely abstract art. His art turns out to be abstractions of sort of natural elements, natural scenes, mountains, you know, forests, things of that such. They're not what's called non-objective. In other words, it's not that they have no relationship to the visual world, they abstract from the visual world. Okay, so Kandinsky, a major influence on my work. In fact, my polls, if you look at them, um, are influenced by the work of Kandinsky, where each one of my images is almost like a Kandinsky, but the difference for me is that a Kandinsky might be made up of a thousand brushstrokes, and I'm trying to achieve a Kandinsky in one brushstroke. Okay, this, the work that um, Aliyah just showed you a moment ago was, was Titian. Titian um, was a um, Venetian high Renaissance artist um, known for his color, his control of color. Um, when I was doing pastels early on, I would look at Titian's, Titian, excuse me, Titian portraits every day as a guide and an inspiration, okay? Titian. Um, and, and Titian, by the way, always signed his paintings. Titian, he did it in Latin, but the Latin translations, Titian was working on this, okay? The point is never quite thought it was finished, right? That is typical in the history of art, right? Leonardo never finished a painting. Okay, Michelangelo finished one sculpture, nothing else. Okay, so okay, keep that in mind. Um, okay, next, um, let's see. Do we have uh, the next we have word? Good. What's a that? Of minutes. Yeah. You have more or? We have a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, do you have any more images or should I? Sh yeah, I can show one more, this one. Uh, just one moment. Please. Oh, yeah, the Rembrandt, the last one was Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt is an artist that I have vast admiration for. There's no greater draftsman than Rembrandt. Um, the Hermitage, that's Rembrandt, that's a late work by Rembrandt. Um, it's called Prodigal Son Returns. Um, his, um, his, his paintings were done with all kinds of techniques, including um, painting with his fingers. Um, this is a late work. Um, the Hermitage has a lot of Rembrandts in its collection. Um, there's also, let me just, should I just go down, name a few? Let me just go down and name. So El Greco, um, here's an El Greco, um, Spanish, from Greece, um, but worked in Spain. Um, 17th century, an artist that I have great respect for. Uh, Monet, the Impressionist, um, his works come alive visually in ways that were revolutionary for the time. Matisse, that's the dance, one of Matisse's greatest works, um, that's in the Hermitage. Um, Gauguin um, worked with Van Gogh, um, they fought um, Van Gogh uh, after they had a bad falling out, Van Gogh cut off part of his ear because um, Gauguin wanted Van Gogh to paint from his memory. Um, Gauguin did. Super. Van Gogh only successfully painted from the object. Okay, so that did, that part of should been worked out. Um, then there was Giorgione. Giorgione is also a Venetian High Renaissance artist. There are only about half a dozen Ven Giorgiones in existence. I've never seen one in person. The Hermitage has one, okay? Um, there's a Leonardo. Mm -hmm. We always love Leonardo. Um, there's a Caravaggio, an early Caravaggio. Caravaggio was known for high contrast of light and dark. Um, Goya, um, stunning, um, psychologically penetrating portraits. 
Picasso is one of my all-time favorite artists. That's an early Cubist work. And finally, Cezanne. There are a lot of Cezannes in the Hermitage. Sure. Cezanne was probably the single most important influence on the work of Picasso and so on the rise of modern art, per se. Fair. Okay. So there's a little Super. of what I would appreciate seeing in the Hermitage. So yeah, one more time. First of all, we would like to thank Stephen Friedman. Thank you for your philosophical talks, for your amazing pictures uh, and the artworks, and also the clues and the information that you provided. Thank you very much. We really appreciate having you uh, with us every Friday. Also, thank you very much uh, to our audience. Thank you for joining us today. We're very glad to see you all. Please make sure to give your comments, to give your uh, questions, uh, and join us next Friday. We will look forward to having you. And thank you very much. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you next week. Have a good week. Bye. Bye thank bye. you. Bye now. Bye.